Did you know that nearly all popular music genres in America were created or influenced by African Americans? Did you know that the first form of distinctly American music originated from the African American community? For example, ragtime, which was invented in the late 19th century, was arguably the first form of truly original American music. Ragtime has influences from minstrel show, African American banjo style, rhythms of cakewalk, and European march. Today when you hear ragtime, you probably picture some old-timey British looking people or maybe the melodies that you would hear playing in the backgrounds of saloons of Red Dead Redemption. Or maybe even the pomp and European wealth of the Titanic. The last thing you will probably think about is Black Americans. This pattern of misplaced credit is an unfortunate trend that can be traced all throughout American history. African American contributions to American music range from the blues and jazz to country and rock and roll all the way up to the present with pop and hip hop. What's so interesting to me about all of this though is that not only did black Americans contribute so much to American culture and music, but they literally time and time again have created the very genres that have come to be known as distinctly American, but ironically also distinctly white American music. This fact has always annoyed the hell out of me, so today I wanted to talk a little bit more about underappreciated black contributions in American culture and music, and also why I believe white Americans are so influenced by it. Also, um, I'm, believe it or not, I'm not a historian, but please forgive me if I possibly say anything inaccurate, and please also feel free to add on if I miss anything in the comments. So just as ragtime was born in southern black spaces, but has really come to be associated with white people, so have many, many other traditionally African-American sounds. A short time after the invention of ragtime, what has come to be known as jazz originated in New Orleans in the early 20th century. Jazz is characterized by improvisation, deliberate pitch and timbre distortion, and syncopated rhythm. Jazz was heavily influenced by the blues, which appeared just after the end of the Civil War and is largely thought to have originated on southern black plantations. The unique, melancholic, and somber tone of the blues evolved from field holler and work song, Christian hymn, ragtime, and minstrel show music. Again, to the uninformed or somebody who doesn't really listen to jazz, if I were to ask you about it, you probably would think of the contemporary version that today you might imagine playing in some high-end restaurant of the Upper East Side of Manhattan. When you think of jazz, you probably first think of Frank Sinatra or Tony Bennett before Ella Fitzgerald or Louis Armstrong. Modern forms of jazz have now become ironically associated with the upper echelons of white conformist society, despite the fact that when it first originated, it was seen as rebellious, lowbrow, and even degenerate and immoral. My point here is that if you're not hip to the history of these forms of music, you'd be forgiven to have this misguided perception because that is exactly what white America intended. Find a unique sound, use it, rebrand it, give it a white face, and then take all the credit. Then there's country, which has arguably become seen as the most stereotypical white American music genre. Jimmy Rogers, who is largely seen as the father of country, was known for combining blues, jazz, gospel, and folk style in his songs. Country wouldn't be able to exist if it didn't have these historically black sounds to build its foundations off of. Another genre which has become immortalized in the American canon as uniquely American is rock and roll. <laughs> Early on, rock and roll was known as rockabilly, which was a mix of African American sounds like country, swing jazz, and the rhythm and blues. When you think of rock and roll today, again, you probably first see Elvis instead of Otis Blackwell or Little Richard. Time and time again, what American history likes to paint or portray as original white music was in reality a black sound that was, again, appropriated by white faces and labels and slightly tweaked to appeal to larger white audiences. Now, to anyone watching this that isn't black, this might all seem surprising, especially country and rock and roll, but obviously this is a fact that the black community has been aware and vocal about for decades and is still vocal about to this day. The message I, f I see when I see these Grammys being given out, like these, because it, it's, it's bigger than just like playing the sh on the radio and I don't, you know what I mean? Like that's fine. Do what you're going to do. But it's, I have a problem when you're trying to like 
say that it's hip hop and you're trying to like put it like up against black culture like it's like mm. a cultural smudging was what I see mm. and when they give these Grammys out all it says to white kids is like oh yeah you're great you're amazing you can do whatever you put your mind to and it says to black kids you don't have sh you don't own shit, not even the shit created for yourself this has always made not just me but honestly anybody who learns about this wonder why do white Americans have this almost constant desire to take from other cultures but especially black culture in order to answer that we got to go back we got to go way back so one thing you need to know about white america to understand all of this is that they never really had a distinct original culture to begin with now i'm not saying that they didn't have any culture at all just that they didn't have something that was distinct and original. Nowadays, what we imagine or picture as American culture is the byproduct of the mixing that occurred in mostly the 19th and 20th centuries. But before these periods, due to white supremacy and racial stigmatization of non-Anglo-Saxon races, what was considered true American culture was really non-existent. Or again, at least non-existent in the sense of being distinct from Europe. Whenever I think about this, I immediately think of the Vanderbilts in the late 19th century. The Vanderbilts were one of the richest families in America that were so admired and famous that they were sometimes seen as American royalty or America's version of European aristocracy. They would throw extravagant and balls where they would dress in costumes inspired by different European time periods and European royalty. I view these balls as a sort of microcosm of white America for that time period and a peek into just how much Americans associated Europe with pomp and real culture. This was an awkward transitory time for America and how it viewed itself and its cultural identity. Due to the lasting effects of Puritanism and basically the scrubbing of all cultural aspects of the countries the colonists originally came from in favor of strict religious law and society, what was considered distinctly American against again, didn't yet exist. America was a country that took pride in being separate from Europe and the old world, but at the same time admired its culture and would attempt to copy and reimagine it, but in a refined, bigger, and better fashion. So it's like, in a way, white Americans attempted to be like Europeans while at the same time being against their old world traditions and wanting to be distinct. White American culture, or what at this time was seen as real or true, genuine American culture, becomes an attempt at being a better Europe, but always seems to fall short and comes off to Europeans as more of a tacky, sloppy attempt at plagiarism. The more you try to be something that you are not, the more emphasis that inadvertently gets placed on the differences instead of the similarities to whatever it is that you are trying to mimic. White Americans always resented their lack of real concrete culture, especially because Europe was also still the center of the world at this time. Europe was what America is now. And it was very well known that Europe, and even to this day, had a real distaste for American society, viewing it as tasteless, dirty, and even barbaric. So basically, for the first 100 years or so of American history, Americans were... I don't know if this is the correct word to use, but in a way swooning over Europe and in a way attempting to impress them or cultivate their own European style American culture. You can even see the lasting effects of this mindset as recent as the 1950s and the transatlantic accent, where American actors would talk in a more English style inflection because they internalized European critique and found their own accents to be grating, unprofessional, or uncultured. George. <sighs> I'm going to. Why, why not? Come around about noon tomorrow. The reason all this is so relevant is because this constant attempt at creating a distinct culture, but by imitating Europeans, left this vacuum for something truly unique to become American. And the only groups that were not as restrained by conservative values or these attempts at constantly impressing others were African and immigrant cultures. The African American community provided a cultural environment with an abundance of authentic, unshackled creativity. In a society where the mainstream dominant forces of white America were restricted by European and conservative social rules, what African Americans had to offer felt novel, refreshing, and fun. The African American community was forcibly removed from being included in these white, culturally oppressive spaces, and therefore to an extent those rules, so they were better able to practice genuine creative innovation. Now to be fair here, white America did not just 
admire and imitate African American music because they saw it as just so creative and genius and they just couldn't resist. But there was also the perception that was rooted in racism that African and really all non-white cultures were seen as exotic, which therefore made these people seen as almost like exotic animals or accessories or popular trends that we still see happening up to this day. This has its roots all the way back in colonialism where European explorers would come into contact with native populations and view them as exotic, primitive, and even animalistic. This created two forms of discrimination. First, the obvious, well-known, harmful belief that these people were literally racially inferior or primitive, but it oftentimes also swung the other way towards a form of what I like to call positive discrimination, like seeing these people as overly uniquely exotic, like how today you might hear some out of touch people say that African Americans are just genetically predisposed to being good at basketball or good at singing soulful music because they're just so good at it. Even though the latter may seem positive and even flattering, both statements seek to other these people and describe and reinforce ideas of racial or genetic differences. Because black Americans also had to be so vocal about the oppression and injustice they face in order to achieve true equality, White Americans also cultivated this image of the black American as a trendy symbol of rebellion against the establishment, especially during the civil rights movement. Now, after the formation of the counterculture in the 1960s and the rise of postmodernism, rebellion becomes seen as a fashionable but disposable style to white Americans while being the involuntary reality for black Americans. And now, for the people watching this that argue, wait a minute, hold up. Culture, art, and music are meant to be shared and to mix and to blend. It has happened all throughout history. You are 100% right. The problem here is not the mixing of culture, and it never was. It is the fact that black Americans have never truly gotten credit for their talent and innovations. And not only that, but on top of it, black Americans have been made to feel like their culture or music is trashy, immoral, or just alien and non-American. While white artists who literally do the same thing are praised as genius or become canonized into white American culture. I think this is one of the many forms of collective gaslighting that African Americans have had to deal with since they arrived in North America. And I also know I should not have to say this, but this video is also not meant to be some attack on white Americans. White Americans have also contributed to the country's culture like all immigrants and peoples have. But the idea that white Americans are the authentic originators of everything that is considered not only American, but real American culture is not only insane and wrong, but flat out un-American. This brings me to this point about America in general that has always irked the fuck out of me. Now, this part may seem off topic, but it's important in regards to the bigger picture and how we view American art, music, and just culture in general. So, the racist argument against indulging or allowing what is labeled as anything other than pure American or white American culture and the entire reason why black music was slash is appropriated is this perception that non-white music, fashion, or slang is infringing on the native original culture or is replacing or corrupting it. What people who think this conveniently don't seem to understand or remember is that anyone can be American. America does not have an original or objective race. America does not have an objective culture. It never did. Even the idea of white American itself is a concept, not a reality. There is no nation of white. The white identity is a fabricated amalgamation of different sterilized European nationalities like Irish, British, or German. America is not a country that has some thousand-year-old culture and gene pool that needs preserving or protecting. It is an ever-changing and mixing pot of all races, religions, practices, and languages to try and exclude anyone or their contributions to this immensely diverse tapestry is to deny the very American identity itself. The moment we actually start recognizing this and appreciating all peoples and their contributions, the closer we come to fully realizing a concept that is true to actual American ideals that has never been fully realized. 